Uh, as Thurai said, I will be talking about accreditation of international medical schools, uh, but I'll also be filling in for Dr. Casamatis, who's chair of the ECFMG board. Uh, excuse me, he's president of ECFMG and chair of the FAMER board. Uh, he sends his regards and he's uh, sorry to miss you, but on behalf of him, uh, I've been asked to speak about the GME cap in the U.S. and its impact on international medical graduates. So what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about demographic specialization, competence, roles, and quality of care provided by international medical graduates in the U.S., and then I'll talk uh, briefly about possible influences on the effect of the cap. Uh, most of my time I'll spend talking about accreditation of medical schools, and I'll start with giving you kind of a survey of what's going on in terms of that around the world, talk a little about the recognition program uh, created by the World Federation for Medical Education, uh, and finally talk a little bit about the Educational Commission for Medical Graduates' decisions around uh, who would be qualified for certification as of 2023. So let's start with the roles and what IMGs do in the U.S. International me medical graduates constitute a significant performance a portion of the medical workforce in the U.S. Uh, they're roughly 22% of all practicing doctors in direct patient care. Uh, that 22% breaks down in two ways. 18% are non-U.S. citizen international medical graduates. 4% are U.S. students who've gone abroad for their medical school and come back. Uh, in terms of country of citizenship, these are the top 10, India being the leader, uh, U.S. being nearby, uh, and other large countries including the Philippines, Pakistan, Russia, and so on. If you look at the country of medical school, it follows to some degree the country of citizenship. Uh, India is the largest. Uh, followed by Philippines and Pakistan. But if you look closely at this, there's also the influence of U.S. citizens who go abroad. So uh, countries like uh, Grenada, Dominican Republic, St. Martin's, Dominico, all those are populated by U.S. citizens who have gone elsewhere for their medical school training. What do they do? Well, they do everything. International medical graduates are represented in all the specialties in the U.S from a low of 7% for orthopedic medicine up to 31% for internal medicine. Uh, not surprisingly, I suppose fewer are in the higher paying specialties. Um, international medical graduates make a much broader contribution to primary care. Uh, they're more than 50% more than of both uh, U.S. and non-U.S. citizen international medical graduates uh, are in primary care as opposed to just 45% of U.S. medical graduates. Uh, this looks at specialty certification. Uh, what you see is the percentage of each group that's certified by the year they graduated from medical school. Uh, red line are U.S. medical graduates, green line are non-U.S. citizens, and black line are U.S. citizens who've gone, gone, gone abroad for their training, uh, U.S. IMGs. Uh, if you look at the older practitioners, uh, what you see are significant differences between these groups with the U.S. medical grads much more heavily certified by the specialty boards than the other two groups. Uh, but what you also see is that when you get into more recent graduates, uh, non-U.S. citizen international medical graduates perform as well on the specialty board exams as do the U.S. medical graduates. Uh, non-U.S., excuse me, U.S. citizens lagging by about 10 or 15 percent. In terms of what they do, these are the percent of various groups that work in underserved areas. And again, the colors of the lines are the same. So the bottom is red, uh, which is U.S. medical grads. The black and green are non-U.S. or U.S. citizens who've, uh, who are international medical grads. And as you can see, they work more often in uh, underserved areas by about 5 or 8 percent per group. And finally, something that's been of tremendous interest to FAMER over the past couple years has been uh, whether international medical graduates produce the same quality of care as U.S. medical graduates. <clears throat> so we've been lucky in Pennsylvania to have access to a particular database that contains all the admissions to all the hospitals in the state of Pennsylvania over time. 
Um, that hospitals are required to do that by law. And they're also required to send the medical records from the first few days of the patient's stay to a third party. That third party turns it into a probability of death on admission to hospital, essentially a correction for severity of illness. So we put all this together along with uh, hospital characteristics like their volume and whether they're located in rural parts of Pennsylvania, uh, as well as the doctor characteristics, uh, their volume, how many are board certified, how long they've been outside of, out of training. And what we found is that there is no difference between international medical graduates and U.S. medical graduates for the procedures we looked at, uh, cabbage and valves. Uh, there were also no differences in medical uh, conditions, acute myocardial infarction and congestive heart failure, between international medical graduates and U.S. medical graduates. Interestingly, though, if you look at the patients of the non-U.S. IMGs, their mortality is significantly lower than that of the U.S. medical grads and the U.S. citizens who've gone abroad. So the bottom line here is that international medical graduates make a, a substantial contribution to the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, they fill primary care specialties at a greater rate than the U.S. kids do. They're comparable in terms of uh, competence. A greater percentage serve vulnerable populations. And they offer quality of care that's at least the equal of U.S. medical graduates. So. Uh, one of the things that's happening in the U.S., I imagine many of the folks in this room know about it, is the so-called cap on GME slots. That there's funding, the funding for, for graduate medical education slots has been capped, and as a consequence, there's a concern about that because the U.S. medical schools are expanding both in number and number of students at the same time. So what this slide shows is uh, data we've compiled from our colleagues at the AAMC, the American Medical Association, the Osteopathic Physicians, and the MATCH program. Uh, the blue line indicates everybody's best guess about how many positions will be available over time. The green line indicates how many MD and osteopathic physicians would be available to fill those slots. And as you can see over time, the two are coming closer together. And there's a, a, a question about whether uh, this will have an impact on international medical graduates and reduce the numbers coming to the U.S. This occurs at the same time that the U.S. has a, a, a workforce shortage or a looming workforce shortage according to the planners in this area. Uh, that workforce shortage is uh, not only in the primary care specialties but many parts of the U.S. And the shortage is likely to get worse as people like me get old. Uh, and more Americans are insured through the, uh, through the ACA. So to the degree that there are physician shortages and, and maldistributions, uh, my sense is that that's going to create some political pressure uh, and as a consequence encourage solutions to the financing issues with the GME. And we heard a little bit ago uh, about some ideas for GME that might help this. Um, Despite all of this, I think the GME positions might actually continue to increase regardless of the cap. There was a recent bill passed uh, for VA funding that increased the number of positions by 1,500 or so. Uh, the ACGME will soon be accrediting osteopathic uh, slots, oste osteopathic uh, residency programs, and they may become more attractive to international medical graduates. And I believe that there will be a series of alternate funding mechanisms for GME that will evolve regardless of what else is done. I know that there are some individuals and countries interested in funding their fellows to get graduate training in the U.S. Finally, and I think most importantly, is that the, especially the non-U.S. citizen international medical graduates are extraordinarily competitive. Uh, the expanded U.S. schools are basically going to fill those positions that they're creating with the students who are now going abroad, the current U.S. IMGs. And that group is routinely outperformed by the non-U.S. IMGs. Um, in addition, there's sort of a logic that says, well, maybe if they, they're trained in the U.S., the quality of the schools will be better, so this won't matter that the, the substrate, the trainees, aren't quite as capable to begin with. Uh, that may be the case, but if you look at the research literature across education uh, broadly, 
the ability of admitted students generally has a, a bigger impact on outcomes than the exact nature of the educational process. So in terms of, in terms of uh, the possible impacts of the cap, uh, I think we'll, we'll wait for several years to see what happens, uh, but I don't believe that the situation is quite as dire as people have made it out to be. So let me switch gears from that and talk a little about accreditation internationally. And by accreditation, what we're talking about is a process that reviews and evaluates educational programs against a clearly defined set of standards. And so what I'll do is take us on a little tour uh, around the world uh, in terms of several facets of accreditation, ask whether it's mandatory and a variety of other questions that you can see on this slide. So I'll take each one, spend a minute or two with each. So the first is, as you look around the world, are, there, are the accrediting uh, bodies mandatory? Do they require that, to, must medical schools be accredited? And this varies by country and even accrediting body within a particular country. In addition to that, voluntary isn't always voluntary. Uh, in the U.S., we say that the LCME is a voluntary process, and you can create a medical school that's not sort of accredited by the LCME, but your students can't be admitted to uh, licensing exams, they can't take postgraduate training, they can't get specialty certification, and they can't practice medicine, so it's not really voluntary. So when you look at voluntary, it's, it's, uh, it's not real. Uh, what are the benefits? Well, the primary benefit of, of accreditation, I think, is that it provides an opportunity to improve. Uh, when it's voluntary, schools use it to enhance their reputation, to retain their current students, to allow their students to move around easily. Uh, when it's mandatory, it's uh, required for continued funding for the graduates to be eligible to practice. If you look around the world, the consequences of not being accredited are similar. If you haven't been accredited, you get time to improve. Uh, and if you don't improve, ultimately you're closed. Very rare in the US, very rare everywhere else. What's accredited? In several countries, institutions like the medical, not like the uh, university are accredited. And from that, the medical school or other health profession schools derive their accreditation. Some countries, it's the program itself that's accredited, and in some countries like the US, it's a dual model where both the university needs to be accredited as does the medical school. Who accredits? Well, there, there are over 100 countries around the world that have some kind of accreditation process or other, uh, usually a governmental entity, often a Ministry of Health or, fin or uh, uh, Education. Uh, as well, there are a number of independent agencies who do this, often professional groups, Sometimes the independent agency acts on behalf of the government. What are the focus of the standards? I'm gonna dawdle here for a minute and talk about three different kinds of standards, three different models. One is a prescriptive model, second is a process model, and the third is an outcomes model. So in a prescriptive model, uh, the accrediting body provides incredibly detailed guidance on all aspects of a medical school. So they'll tell you what departments you have to have, what your curriculum needs to be, about your faculty, about your facilities, and about even what kind of supplies you need to have. Um, the advantage of this is that it ensures compliance, and it's certainly pretty straightforward to figure out whether somebody meets the criteria. Uh, the downside of these kinds of accreditation processes is that they completely stifle innovation. It's hard to change when you're under these kinds of uh, conditions. So an advantage of this is the Medical Council of India, and I pulled these off, uh, off their website uh, six months ago or so. Uh, and these are the MCI requirements for a medical school class of 100. So the Medical Council of India says you have to have these departments. You may have other departments if you want, but these are the ones you have to have. And I wanna focus just a half a minute on pharmacology and talk about what this means. So the Department of Pharmacology needs to have, must have, the following staff strength. It must have one professor. It must have one associate professor. It must have two assistant professors, two tutors, two lab assistants, one storekeeper, and two sweepers. And the accommodations of these staff are also made clear. The professor gets 18 square meters. Associate professor gets 15 and so on down the line, okay? 
So, you know, this is, this, this is we, we may think of this as unusual, given where we come from, but this may, in the context of India, be a very functional system where there are vast numbers of medical schools, very low resources uh, in some places, uh, and where it's quite difficult to keep up with the accreditation of all these schools. We're probably more familiar with the process model, uh, where you provide guidance on the educational process. This is the dominant model around the world. Uh, an example of this is the standards put together by the World Federation for Medical Education. They have standards for undergraduate, postgraduate, and CME. They have both basic and quality development standards. The idea for these standards is that every country will take a look at them and modify them to meet their local needs. So the idea here was to provide a general template that could act as guidance to folks as they create their own accrediting process, but wouldn't be so confining that it wouldn't be able to take care of local needs. Advantage of these kinds of process models is that, that um, they allow creativity and they allow medical schools to develop. Uh, the downside is that it doesn't guarantee good outcomes, nor do these models guarantee outcomes that meet the healthcare needs of communities. So the WFME standards cover the things on this slide. So there's uh, standards for legal framework, organization, and structure, and so on. And if you look into the main elements, there are standards for mission and objectives, educational program, and so on. And if you dig just a little bit deeper into things like academic and staff and faculty, you'll see these are the standards for recruitment and selection for staff activity and development process. Very loose, very general, um, but possible to wait with uh, a site visit to get a sense of how and whether the medical school meets these standards. Uh, the process for applying these standards actually is reasonably universal when they're used. Uh, the institutions typically uh, create, complete a guided self-study. Uh, an external group uh, swoops in and does a peer, peer visit, and an accreditation decision is made based on both the self-review and the visit. It's disseminated, and this is repeated periodically. Last method I want to talk about is outcomes model. Um, outcomes model provides guidance on the expected competencies. So it fits well with the co international competency movement. Um, unfortunately, I think these are still, in many instances, uh, in the conceptual phases. One of the first groups that I think did a very nice study on this is the Institute for International Medical Education, spin off of the China Medical Board. Um, and I'll describe that a little bit in a minute. The uh, advantage of these is that uh, you don't get involved in the process nor the duration of training. You get involved in specifying the outcomes and you make sure that those outcomes match the needs of the community. Downside is that education is still largely time-based and assessment, which is absolutely critical to this, isn't well developed enough, I don't think, in order to support the kinds of outcomes people are interested in. At any rate, uh, the IIME had developed a set of global minimum essential requirements. For those of you familiar with uh, good medical practice in the UK, the ACA GME competencies, these all are looking pretty much the same. And what they did is they experimented with nine or 10 medical schools in China tested the students and actually were reasonably successful in showing that the schools achieved the kinds of outcomes that they were interested in. So they're the models. What are some of the variations, other variations as you go around the world? Um, there are agencies accrediting in two or more countries. So the uh, CARICOM countries, the English speaking countries in the Caribbean have a single accrediting body. Australia Medical Council does Australia and New Zealand. The opposite of that is also true in many places. There are two or more agencies in one country. So India has two, the US has two. Um, in some cases, the standards that have been developed and applied aren't specific to medical education. In other contexts, there's a standardized curriculum rather than standards. Uh, and in some countries, accreditation is limited to either the publicly or privately funded institutions or a particular language of instruction. Um, in my view, this is probably the most disappointing thing about accreditation. 
Uh, there is little or no work published on this. We have a smart young woman in our office, Marta Van Zanten, who we funded to get her PhD. Uh, and she did this as her dissertation. I'm aware that uh, there are one or two folks in Saudi Arabia who just completed a dissertation on this topic. But the bottom line is there's little research on this, and I, I really think it's, it's, um, it's an area of tremendous need. We need studies showing that accreditation improves medical education. We need to know which systems of accreditation produce better results, and we need some information about the values of specific standards and procedures. Uh, I'm really delighted that uh, Eric Ombo uh, has uh, just started to work at the ACGME, and I'm strongly hoping that, uh, that, that he's going to fill this research gap single-handedly. So where do you find all this stuff? Um, FAMER has put together a directory of organizations that recognize and accredit medical schools. So listing by country, we update it as often as we can and is complementary to the World Directory of Medical Schools, which we produce jointly now with the World Federation for Medical Education. Um, if you look in that World Directory, you find 170 or so territories having operating medical schools. Uh, 100 plus, about 60%, have uh, accreditation processes included in DORA, and some have more than one, as I mentioned. Uh, this is as exhaustive as we can make it but that doesn't mean it's perfectly exhaustive. There are probably bodies we're missing. So if you hear of any, send me an email. So if you go to our website, this is what it looks like. And you see here there are listings by country. And if you click on a country, what you get is uh, more information about exactly what's going on there, uh, duration, uh, evaluation process, and most importantly, a hyperlink where we have it to their website. And that leads you to expanded information, links to documents like the standards. Uh, some, some countries actually, some accrediting bodies actually report on individual schools and so on. So in summary, uh, there are a number of accreditation systems around the world. 60% of countries at least have their own accreditation process. There's huge global variability across a whole variety of, of uh, measures. And because of that huge variety, the World Federation of uh, Medical Education decided that it would offer recognition uh, for those accrediting bodies. They think of it as a transparent or rigorous way to ensure high standards. And the goal of this recognition process is to encourage uh, accreditation where there isn't any, to ensure the integrity of the systems that are working, and basically to improve the quality of accreditation everywhere. Um, as I said, this program recognizes accrediting agencies. It does not recognize individual schools. So the agencies include government entities and the independent kind of entities I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, they have developed a whole set of criteria for recognition. Obviously, things like appropriate scope of authority, acceptance of decisions, you need to have standards, you need to have a process and procedure in place, policies and resources all specified in quite some detail. Um, in order to get involved in this, the accrediting agency needs to express interest. They complete an application and a self-study. There's a site visit by a team which puts together a report that goes to the WFME uh, Recognition Committee who makes a decision on the results. Uh, this is a very new program, just began. Um, Caribbean uh, Accreditation Authority was the first body to be accredited in 2012. Uh, the Turkish Accrediting Agency was uh, accredited last year. And uh, the US LCME and the Canadian CACM systems have stepped up to the plate and have been accredited recently as well. Um, there is ongoing interest in this. There are 10 agencies currently in the pipeline. And they're the bigger, bigger agencies around. They uh, would cover 20% of the world's medical school graduates. Um, the operation is in the process of being built. All materials are available on the web. Uh, the new president of uh, WFME, David Gordon, has assembled uh, an international group of advisors who will do the site visits. Uh, we put together uh, operational and business plans. Uh, this, is, this process is expected to be able to recognize eight to 10 agencies a year, uh, and we can scale it to be larger if need be. 
So the last thing I'll mention is ECFMG 20 and the 20 decision about 2023. ECFMG is the body that certifies international medical graduates for entry to postgraduate training in the U.S. Uh, starting in 2023, physicians uh, will need to be graduates of schools that have been appropriately accredited. The accreditation has to be a formal uh, process, and they have to use criteria similar to the World Federation or the LCME. Uh, obviously, WFME recognition would be considered uh, a gold standard in this regard. Uh, as part of that, ECFMG has directed us, FAMER is, uh, uh, as you may or may not know, is ECFMG's foundation, has directed us to support those efforts. Uh, as a consequence, we provide op operational infrastructure to the recognition program of the WFME. Uh, in addition, along with colleagues in uh, the UK, we've developed a master's degree in health professions education with a focus on accreditation and assessment. Uh, the important thing about this is that the first year of that program is a certificate, and that certificate can be taken completely online. Um, and we, so we hope, and we've started the program, uh, it will be a useful support for those groups who are trying to do accreditation locally. Um, in addition to that, FAMER has a number of workshops and programs that we can put together, tailored to local needs, other medical schools or accrediting agencies. So in summary, there's tremendous variability in accreditation around the world. The WFME, I think, has done a wonderful job by creating a program that recognizes those accrediting agencies. Uh, ECFMG has a 2023 deadline and is charged FAMER to support those who need help. Uh, and I'm optimistic uh, that uh, we'll be successful in both of these endeavors and that ultimately it'll improve both education and accountability. Thanks.